Here is his background right here. Austin, do you want to give a couple words to the folks to let them know who you are? Yeah, so I, I, both Michigan and I are CPA attorneys, but Michigan practices just on the CPA side, and I practice just as an attorney. Um, among many of practice areas, I've been deeply involved in the last 10 years in um, international disclosures, uh, international information returns, amnesty programs, et cetera. And I work closely. Um, I, I'm part of Gray Reed, which is a, a Texas-based law firm. Um, but I work closely with Michigan and the Wolf Group and CPAs um, across America and across the world in helping with the, the legal side of, of strategizing, disclosing the IRS, um, you know, dealing with the mechanics of, of um, you know, wor working at the through issues with the IRS. Um, so, uh, like I said, Michigan and I work very closely together and have resolved, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of cases at this point. Yeah, and you know, like I said, I, I met Austin at the 2016-2017 Leadership Academy. My, my point to that story was um, the majority of practitioners there do state and local tax or did state and local tax, whereas Austin and I were like the only two that really did international tax. And it was funny how international tax folks tend to gravitate towards each other. Um, but it was good that we met there and we've been working together ever since on a variety of cases. We've both been probably working on offshore voluntary disclosure or streamlined filing since the inception of all of these programs. So it's funny to us when we see new things come out, you know, it's very interesting slash funny. Um, we always kind of, you know, dovetail that with the history of what we know. Um, one of the things I want to make sure to clearly point out here is that we're not giving legal advice here. You should not hang your hat on this presentation if you do a submission. Make sure that you go talk to a professional, your CPA or whoever you're working with. Um, analyze your facts and circumstances. Make sure you understand all the moving parts before you make a submission. Um, this is just our opinion, and we're trying to give you the best information available uh, on this topic. Okay, without further ado, to get into the, the presentation itself. So I, I feel like it's important that we give some context as to why the notice came out here. So I'm going to do a couple pre-context slides for everybody. The first thing I, I want everyone to remember uh, is that there's, there's a backlog, and there's been a backlog for quite some time. And when we say backlog, we're not only talking about income tax returns, we're talking about international informational reports, we could be talking about streamlined filing submission procedures, we could be talking about penalty abatements, um, which is the IRS Form 843, we could be talking about responses to notices, correspondence, miscellaneous forms like the residency certifications on the Form 8802, all of those things are all floating around in the backlog. And the backlog stems from the shutdown, the coronavirus shutdown, which basically occurs from mid-March 2020 to August 2020. Um, from there, the, the backlog basically ballooned to about 35 million items in mid-2021. The IRS chopped it down to 10 million at the end of 2021. It jumps back up to 21 million in May of 2022. And they got it down, recent reports about, about a little over 10 days ago, 10, 12 days ago, down to about 8.7 million. The, the interesting thing to note here is that prior to the Inflation Reduction Act, the IRS basically said, hey, you know, our staffing, we can only process 200,000 tax returns a week to catch up. We need five, we need to process 500,000. And then magically after the Inflation Reduction Act is passed, but no funds have been dispersed, the IRS all of a sudden can process 600,000 tax returns a week and they're getting caught up very quickly. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's very interesting to see the approach from, from the backlog of, of the Internal Revenue Service. A couple other things to note that have been going on in the background. So we've got a combination of the National Taxpayer Advocate. You have various representatives of Congress making various announcements about how they think the backlog should be dealt with. You've got the Treasury announces in March of this year, there's an all hands on deck approach to clearing the backlog. The commissioner makes a pledge, we're gonna get it done, we're gonna clear it. The IRS says, hey, look, you gotta get rid of paper, you know, we need paper scanning technology. The commissioner reiterates his, ple his pledge to quote unquote, get healthy to Congress. Um, shortly thereafter, there's a huge drop in customer service um, showing on the TICTA report in May. Um, we see further that letters are sent, to are sent to the IRS from Congress about the international, or not international, but the information report destruction that occurred. So for those that don't remember, there's about 30 to 35 million information reports, which could include international information reports that were destroyed by the IRS. Um, so there's, there's a lot of concern here about the backlog and things that are coming out of the backlog. 
Um, and about mid mid year this year, you have the taxpayer advocate notating that there's still a 21 million backlog. Then they admit that there's a backlog with processing OBDPs and streamlined filings. The AACPA sends a letter to the Treasury saying, hey, we need to understand how you guys are going to deal with this. Senate does the same thing. IRS issues guidance for interim destruction of, of documents so that people don't destroy international informational reports uh, at the IRS. And it goes on and on and on uh, until we get to the Inflation Reduction Act, which was, which was signed into law on August 16th. Um, and in the same day, basically, the uh, Ways and Means Oversight Committee sends a letter from the IRS saying, look, we need to see an action plan of how you're going to be dealing with the backlog. Um, shortly thereafter, the IRS releases what we're talking about today, which is notice 2022-36, and they indicate, look, we think about 1.6 million taxpayers will receive relief. We're estimating that we're going to issue about 1.2 billion in refunds. This is going to be a huge win, not only for taxpayers, but it's going to help us clear our backlog, and everyone's going to ride off into the sunset feeling great. One thing to note, which a lot of people have not been talking about, because I, I saw a lot of write-ups on notice 2022-36, the day it came out, there's been an update in the Internal Revenue Manual, manual a revised update to it that clarifies some things for notice 2022-36. We'll talk about that here today, but that, that's the last kind of item in the timeline. Okay, here's a direct snip from notice 2022-36. It's basically saying, look, there's been an unprecedented effect on the IRS personnel and operations from the pandemic. They've been working aggressively to process the backlog. However, they believe that this relief is going to help, you know, the backlog and also help taxpayers. So basically just summarizing what I, what I just said there. Okay. Here is a list of the IRS international informational forms that, um, that, that basically have 10,000 plus penalties. And I wanna make sure to bring this up because a lot of people see only certain forms, right? They're only thinking, okay, 5471, 3520, 8938 FBAR, but there's a whole laundry list of various international informational returns that can have a $10,000 penalty. And in addition to that, there can be continuing penalties, there can be statute of limitations issues. So I use this as context for the discussion that we're about to have on notice 2022-36. I also want to make sure people understand that there are various internal revenue codes that apply before the IRS should be giving a $10,000 penalty. Um, and so for, for example, internal revenue code 6751 basically requires the IRS supervisor to sign off on a $10,000 penalty. This is a copy of what a 5471 penalty looks like. Um, that is really not being done. That has not been followed over the last couple of years. Basically what happens is you have a computer that's spitting out the, the penalty and then the supervisor may sign that afterwards. So it's kind of the cart uh, coming before the horse there. You also have different sections of the Internal Revenue Code that apply to some of the sections in, in this notice relief. And basically, Internal Revenue Code 6212 says, look, the IRS is required to provide a notice of deficiency before assessing a tax liability, right? That's, that's as constitutional as we can get, notice in a hearing. And for those of us that went to law school, that's, that's, that's con law 101, right? Um, but the IRS basically says, look, for these international forms, we don't think that's necessary. We can use Internal Revenue Code 6671. We can assess the penalty. We don't have to give notice in a hearing. And I promise you, if they did give notice in the hearing, they'd probably resolve a lot of these issues without having to act, issue an actual penalty. Um, as we saw in 2021, 71% of all international penalties were abated in that calendar year. So that lets us know that two out of three times the IRS is on the wrong side of this thing. Okay. Um, and then a great quote from the, from the former IRS chief counsel of the Streamline Unit, Dan Price, Basically, you know, saying, hey, look, the when folks are sending in some of these forms, and, and here we're specifically we're talking about 3520s and 3528s, which have to be mailed in. We've got low-level clerks that are processing these forms. They're basically just inputting the documents. And if it's late, it's late and you get a penalty. They're not reading the beautiful statements of reasonable cause that Austin is preparing and sending in. Um, they should be reading those, but they're not, and they're they're issuing the penalties. Austin, did you want to jump in on it? Yeah, jump in real quick. I mean, these two things that Michigan just talked about is why we are here with this notice, right? Is that the IRS uh, had transitioned to um, computer generating a significant amount of these penalties. Even with reasonable cause statements, they were being ignored. There was no you know, notice. There was no hearing. 
Um, and then finally, you add that to the massive backlog and document destruction, uh, you created basically this perfect storm of tons and tons of taxpayers with large penalties, um, you know, large backlogs, and it taking a long time to get to the IRS. So that's kind of we're leading to like, this is some of the rationale the IRS had. This is why we are where we are is because of a lot of, in my opinion, poor decisions and mismanagement by the IRS that's led to, you know, over a billion dollars of penalties being assessed. Right. And, and, you know, this notice does not cure those issues, those issues with those three sections that we just went over. They're still there. They'll still be there for 2021, 2022. And part of the questions that we'll talk about is, is you know, OK, this relief applies to 19 and 20. But what do we think for 21, 22, 23? Like, how do we think, think about that going forward as we're advising our clients or, or clients themselves are trying to make decisions about, you know, the IRS? Okay, so this is one slide that we may come back to a couple times, and I just want to make sure that everyone understands this is the approach that Austin and I really think needs to be applied here. So when if you're a client, you basically come down to three different paths, right? You either have done an IRS amnesty submission or you've done some kind of penalty abatement, and those have been submitted but not yet resolved with the IRS. Or client number two, you're in the process. You're working on your amnesty submission. Maybe you quite you haven't got you haven't gotten there yet. Um, you know you're going to be submitting in the near future. Uh, same thing with the penalty abatement. You're working on it. The statement of reasonable causes in process, something like that. But it's not yet submitted. How what do you do now? What do you, how do you approach the IRS and this amnesty submission now that we have this notice 2022-36? And then the third one is as Austin says, people that are sitting on the sidelines. They're just kind of waiting. They know they may have an issue. They maybe haven't really fully investigated it quite yet. They're not ready to take that step. They're going to be taking that step in the near future. Those folks may now have some increased uh, you know, desire to come forward using this notice. How should they view this relief and how, how should they take advantage of it if they can? Austin? Michigan, just to jump in too, you know, I, I think our audience is both uh, taxpayers that are learning about this, but to the extent there's also tax practitioners watching you know, if your firm knows of, of issues that either prior CPAs made or maybe your firm had issues that, you know, you, you spotted that there should have been a 5471 filed that maybe you didn't advise a client on, this may be a really good opportunity in this, you know, one month period we have for you to be able to proactively resolve, um, you know, an issue for your clients too. So um, the sidelines applies not just to taxpayers with issues, but also practitioners who have discovered issues, whether or not they created them or not. Yeah, and I know one big one that a lot of practitioners tend to talk about is the RevProc 2020-17, which basically gave, at least we thought at the beginning, gave a huge pass to a lot of 3520, 3520A filings, only to find out that the IRS, what we thought was a very expansive relief, actually was a very limited relief based off of a very narrow reading of that revenue procedure. So for those folks that maybe have clients that stopped filing the 3520 and 3520A, maybe they picked that up again starting in 2021, they may want to go back and revisit those pandemic years, which if you think about what the notice is really aimed towards, it's those two pandemic years that you have there. Okay, so let's start with the international forms that are covered under this notice. So first off, we've got the notice 5471. And for those of you that don't know what that is, or uh, maybe you've heard of it and don't understand it, that is the uh, informational return with U.S. persons that have a certain interest in a foreign corporation. Uh, the Form 5472 um, basically is utilized by, by corporations, so 1120 filers, that maybe have a 25% or more foreign owner. Um, for some folks in our audience, this would apply to a non-U.S. person that is an owner of, of a U.S. disregarded entity. Um, those people have to do a very special filing where you submit 1120 page one and form 5472. So it could, could be applicable in that situation as well. Then we have the forms 3520 and 3520A. Um, the 3520 and 3520A are generally used in combination for foreign grant or trust filings. Uh, the 3520 can be used in a silo to do foreign non grant or trust reporting. And then the 3520 part four in a silo or in combination with other, other uh, those other two types of trusts um, could be used to report a large gift or inheritance from a non-US person to a US person in excess of $100,000. Now, 
the reason I, I list the failure to file penalty here under each of these forms is because I just want to make sure people understand that this is what the relief is covering. It's the specific failure to file penalty related to that particular form. Okay, so the biggest question that we have, and this is what I saw a lot of practitioners were writing about when the when you know the notice first came out was, does the relief for Form 5471, for example, apply to individuals? When you read the the language in the in the in the notice and you read through this, it's like, oh good goodness, this only applies to a 5471 that is attached to a late Form 1120 or a late form 1065, it doesn't seem to indicate that it applies to individuals. And there's several articles out there that, that's, that clearly state that, like, hey, our interpretation is that this relief is very narrow for the form 5471. It does not apply to individuals. However, on August 29th, we have a re proposed revised section. So I, I've looked this up, I really can't see the full details of it. It's, it's out there though. We do think that it will clarify everything. I'm really using the word may here because we definitely want to make sure we get some clarity here. And Austin would love to hear your thoughts on this. But basically, the revised IRM, which is part of the penalty, first time penalty abatement section, basically says, look, the there's no limiting examples here. So for the IRM purposes, which the IRM is the Internal Revenue Manual, who instructs you know people on how what they need to do inside the IRS when processing these forms, the IRS says, look. The relief is available to all taxpayers that file the following returns. There's no limiting language. So if you're a Form 1040 filer and you've got the Form 5471, the relief would apply to you. If you are a Form 1120 filer and you, for, you file that regularly, the, the relief would apply to you and so forth and so forth. So the IRM update seems to kind of override that language that was in that section that you know, I don't think it was written very well. I think it could have been written better um, but yeah, Austin, what do you think about all this? Yeah, no, I, I agree. So, um, one of the things I've talked about with Michigan and other practitioners is, you know, the, the overarching, what I see the goal of what they, of how they drafted this was, um, penalties are assessed by the IRS in two different ways. Some penalties are assessed by the computer. So if you file a late 1040, there's not somebody at the IRS says, man, bad taxpayer, I'm going to, I'm going to get you. It's literally their antiquated computer system says late penalty done. International information returns are the same way. Some, but not all of them, have automatic penalty triggers. And my reading of this, and no one's come out and said that, but they specifically pick these forms, and not all the forms, but Michigan's going to get to that, these forms, because they were ones that were automatic computer generated. The other way that things are generated is, is through audit, of course. Um, and because based on that view, this IRM is consistent with, well, look, 5471 penalties are the type of automatic penalty assessment, right? And they're ones that are automatically assessed, not just on 1120s, um, but also on 1040s, on 1120Ss, on 1120Fs. So this to me is kind of uh, consistent with that theory of they're trying to clear the backlog of computer generated international and failure to file penalties. So I welcome this, This I'm really happy they put this out. This was kind of my view of how they were gonna do it anyway, but it's nice when they, they you know, are gonna put out some authority to clarify that. Absolutely, and what I would tell folks again, because we're, we're making this presentation on a certain date, make sure to go back and double check this, because this is again an area that there's a little bit of attention on before you before you have any of your filers go forward on it. But I agree with Austin, I, I think, I think the, the intention here is to turn off the automatic penalties for these things so that they're not being, hit, people are not being hit with it that are submitting between now and the 30th. Because if people are being hit with that between now and the 30th, it's gonna create a whole nother series of backlog issues, right? The goal here is to solve the backlog, not to create more on top of it. Um, so I think ultimately you'll see that this IRM and then some additional guidance will come out on that. Um, <clears throat> The second question that I think a lot of, at least my clients would have is, does the relief apply for Form 5471 for those non-residents that I talked about that own um, that U.S. disregarded entity? And again, I, I go back to what Austin and I just talked about. There's no limiting language in the IRM. So the relief should apply to all Form 1120 series forms and filings. And this is a big one because this is a huge penalty. These are $25,000 penalties per year. And so I, I you know, 
this is an example, uh, I think, and we'll, we'll get more into this, but because there's really no, no set amnesty program that you can use for these late filings, I think this is a great example of folks that maybe should be submitting their 2019 and 2020 uh, filings with the 5472 before September 30th. Okay, so what international forms does the relief not apply to? And so here's the list of forms where the relief would not apply to. Um, one of the things I wanna make sure people understand is that there are a lot of tie-in forms. Um, so I've had people come forward to me and say, hey, look, I've got that 5471 form. I know that if I submit that one for 1920, I'll get that relief and that will you know, help me out tremendously. But what they're not seeing is that, hey, you also have a guilty form, you have the 8992. You've got contributions to your corpse, so you've got the Form 926. You've got potentially transition tax reporting because you're a fiscal year filer for whatever reason. Um, you've got that that goes in there as well. So there, this does not cure all the forms. Um, and, and I think the reason these forms aren't listed here is what Austin said earlier. There's no automatic penalties on these forms, but there's still a very high risk that the IRS will come back and say, look, we're going to audit you. You've got the 5471 relief, but you know, guess what? We've got you on penalties for the 8992, the 8938, the 926, so forth and so forth. So I think you have to be very careful about you know what what forms you have to file. It's very it's very clear to me that you need to talk to your tax professional to understand. Okay, I'm filing 2019. I'm filing 2020. What are the exact forms that can get me into trouble? Is this relief really going to get me out of all of the penalty liability that, that could be assessed on that particular year? Okay. Other insights into the IRM that I thought were super interesting, and Austin would love to hear your, your comments on this, but basically the relief only provides for penalties that are going to be assessed by an IRS service center or have been assessed by an IRS service center or campus not as a result of audit or examination. So if you've already been caught, you're under audit, you're under exam, you get the penalty, this relief won't apply to that. Um, no explanation was, pro was provided as to why certain forms were included and certain forms were excluded, but I think I just answered that question. And then lastly, and this is really interesting because I've seen a couple of these come through, they're doing now the first time abatement for the international forms, which we never saw that before. But the notice basically says that this, this relief takes precedence to that first time abatement. So theoretically, you could get 19 and 20 abated and then maybe get first time abatement for, for 21. Although I'm not really certain if that's how it would work or you need another two or three years of clean filings and then be able to get first time abatement. So those are some questions that I have technically on how some of these things will work. Austin? Yeah, so I, I think that the reason they're being squirrely about the no explanations provided is because they don't want to go out there and tell you which forms are going to continue to be automatically penalized and which ones aren't. You know, we as practitioners can tell you because we're on your team and uh, we see what actually happens. But, you know, for me, it seems pretty clear. Again, everything that you see right here is consistent with a they just wanted to clear computer generated backlog, but not give any more relief than that. And so, as we'll talk about later, even if you're one of the lucky ones that you're like, well, great, some of these forms are now off the table, the IRS didn't, didn't clear you of everything because in general, if you've got X type of filing, you probably also have Y, not always, but many times. Um, I agree with Michigan. I think the FTA tie-in is interesting. I'm concerned, even if they say that it takes precedence, that if you're relying on FTA in the future, that... Um, the computer systems may not comply the way you want to. So, um, I mean, not, not that anybody ever is advised to rely on first time abatement if they don't have to, obviously try to timely file, but I am dubious of whether or not the first time abatement system is kind of a, a computer um, file that they run on you. And I'm, I'm worried it may not work correctly, but at least this is them saying, hey, that's our intent, is that this doesn't burn up your first time abatement. And, and Austin, normally with part of the pandemic, you could just call into the IRS and get that first time abatement, which normally applies to the tax return itself. But for an international informational return, that's not the same, right? It's not as easy as just calling in and saying, I want the first time abatement. Although maybe the 3520, 3528 have a special hotline for that now. But I think in general, it's a lot harder to call in and, and try to get that FTA for, for those international. The first time abatement also only applies to certain types of penalties. It's not usually international information returns. 
Um, there were some exceptions for 3520s because everything got screwed up with penalties getting assessed despite extensions being filed, penalties being assessed because of EIN issues. And so there were some kind of limited resolution um, options for that, but that's not, it's, the, it's not technically FTA. FTA is more of a failure to file, failure to pay kind of concept. Interesting. Okay, thank you. Okay, so what domestic forms get relief? Because I think this is the other big part of the, the notice that, you know, a lot of people are, are getting it out there like, hey, there's this inter these international forms, there's these, you know, great abatement that's available for, for certain forms in certain situations. But I think this is also a really big part of this notice. It's basically saying, look, if you have these, these tax returns that are delinquent, you know, failure to file, so there's no there's no abatement here for failure to pay or underpayment of estimated tax. So there's still a lot of other penalties that could be associated here. Um, but for the failure to file, you know, the 1040, the 1120, the 1065, the 1041, and then some domestic information returns that have a very specific timeline on them. Um, but there, there's the relief for the failure to file penalty for those specific returns. And I'll jump in again here. I, I view this, the failure to file is, is the government is not losing any tax dollars. Failure to pay is really kind of an interest charge like penalty. And so you see here, there's no abatement of failure to pay. There's no abatement of interest. It's just abatement of, again, a computer generated penalty that doesn't relate to underlying tax liability or interest or interest like payment thereon. Right. Okay. So and I think this was a question that have already came through, um, and, and the person that asked the question basically said, is the relief guaranteed or will the IRS decide on a case-by-case -case basis? Um, basically here, you know, the, the, the notice says the relief is automatic. Um, and so if the penalty has been assessed but not paid, then it should be abated. If it's been assessed and paid, then it will be refunded. But um, while that all sounds great and pie in the sky, I think Austin know that nothing is that easy with the IRS. So. Um, we think that, you know, a good majority of people will probably have the relief automatically applied to them and they'll get notices saying such and checks in the mail and whatnot. Um, I still think that there will be a good handful of people that will have issues with making sure they get the proper relief for this notice. Um, and then we'll also have to do some checking to make sure that the relief is, is done in accordance with the way it's written. Austin, do you have any comments on the uh, on the relief as far as the yeah? Policy? So from from the lawyer side, I get extremely concerned about statute of limitations. So in general, when you pay in tax, you're, you've got a statute of limitations to get that back, either three years from the filing deadline or two years from when the tax is paid, whichever is is later. Um, and so the I, I my our approach, we'll talk about this more. Is you know they say it's automatic and they say it's going to be quick. Uh, so let's, you know, let's give them the first benefit of the doubt. And if they can really issue these things in a month or two, then great. You know, I, we don't want to run up any fees for any clients if, if we're really going to get checks. But we need to be careful and make sure that if something happens and they don't get covered by this, and let's say there's a two-year or three-year clock that's going to run out in, let's say, November, you know, you need to calendar this, you need to monitor this, and you need to come up with a plan that if the refund doesn't come in time, you've got a, a game plan to preserve your rights to this refund. Um, there are ways to do that, including filing an 843 that will basically stop the clock on the statute of limitations. So I would recommend considering that strategy if you're gonna be potentially um, dealing with that. And, and the reason I bring this up is even if these penalties are recent, because they're 19 and 20, sometimes the penalties, uh, amounts that you paid in as refunds for or would have gotten refunds for prior years might be grabbed by the IRS to pay these things. And so you're going to have to like look at where where the refund was generated from or where the, the, the tax was generated and make sure you're not running into a statute problem. So while we applaud this automatic, that's great. I mean, that there's nothing better than automatic. It still is going to need to involve monitoring um, and, and, you know, taking a look at the statute to make sure you don't run into trouble. And, and Austin, the 843 that you're talking about filing, that's just a protective, we, we call that in our world a protective 843. Is that correct? It, exactly. So it's you're supposed to, our 843 is a request for abatement or refund. Um, if you're already supposed to get this, then you don't technically have to file it. But if it's claiming a refund, once you file that, the statute of limitations, you're, you're, as long as you file it before the statute date, even if the action happens later, you're still timely. 
So there may be some situations where we recommend the protective 843, and this is for refunds if the penalty was already paid, not for abatement, because if you haven't paid the IRS, there's no statute issues there, just collections issues. Right. And, and just for those that, that want to understand, the refund statute expiration date, we call that the RSED. Typically, what you do is you call the IRS and you would get that from them. They have that in their computer systems. They just do a master file lookup and they can give you that number. That being said, we've I've seen recent reports that the various statute dates, so assessment statute, ASED, collection statute, CSED, RSED, the IRS has not done a good job tracking those with the pandemic because there have been times where there's a hold on the time. Um, and so for people that are really close on that RSED date, you know, it may be worth going back and by hand calculating that refund statute expiration date to make sure it comports with what the IRS is telling you, because if it's off, then you might want to have a discussion with the IRS to make sure that the right date is, is in there. We, we rarely trust the IRS date, but at least it's good to know <laughs> what they think the right answer is, because right. if they think it's <laughs> earlier than you do, then you might have a fight on your hands. Yes, absolutely. Trust but verify. That's always the case when it comes to that. Okay. So what tax years does this apply to? And it's really funny. I've gotten us a ton of emails on this. I mean, more emails than I can, I can answer today. Um, and I've had people come to me and say, hey, does this apply to the 2015 return that I submitted? No, it does not apply to 2015. It, it applies to only tax years 2019 and 2020. Those are the only two years it applies to. Those, those are what we call what we're calling the pandemic tax years. So those are the only two years that those would apply to. And basically the way it works is for those two tax years, whatever you're trying to get relief from, it must have already been filed, or if it has not been filed, that it needs to be filed on or before September 30th, 2022. And a lot of folks, my advice to folks on filing, especially if you're sending things in with paper, um, and what I'm really focusing on here is the 3520 and the 3520A. I always tell people send it in certified mail return receipt so that you've got that date and it's on there. And hey, I got this in on September 29th because I know, I know this, we're here in the busy season now. The busy season has started for a lot of CPA firms. And you're, you're going to try to mash in a lot of these filings along with those busy season extended returns. It can get a little tricky. So if you're filing at the very last minute on some of this stuff and you're sending it in, send it in certified mail return receipt. If you're sending in tax returns, and I'm thinking specifically right now, just 11, uh, 1040s, um, my rule of thumb is always, especially if it's not electronically filed, if it's electronically filed, great. If it's not electronically filed, always send it in with a check for $1. Why? They'll cash the $1 check. It'll say payment received with tax return. You'll have that date on your account transcript. And then in addition to your certified mail return receipt, you've got two points to say, look, I beat your clock. I got it in before September 30th. If you don't send in that check for $1 made payable to the U.S. Treasury, there, there's, a, in my opinion, 50, Austin, you may have different stats, but my opinion, 50-50 chance it actually gets processed at all, if not timely. Yeah, just agreeing with Michigan, certified mail is vital. Please do it. Please do it. Like I, I'm on the Michigan's on the filing side. I help with that some, but I also help when things go awry. And it is a lot easier for me to get things fixed for you if you can give me a certified mail receipt that was filed. That is the slam dunk. We'll get to the right person. We'll get it fixed. If you just have people come to me and they say, well, look, I've got a credit card statement that I went to FedEx. I'm like, better than nothing, but that's not good enough. The statute says needs to be certified mail. There's a certain other private delivery services that are okay too, but be very careful about how you mail it. Okay, great point there. So let's get into some general questions here. Then these are really questions that, that I have that, you know, as I'm reading through the notice, these are the questions that I was writing down on my tablet and saying, hey, these are the ones that I want answered. Um, what was really funny is that in the section that I have on my tablet, um, I was the section before it are all the questions that I have on RevProc 2020-17, which still to this day have not been answered by the IRS. Um, but these are the general questions that I have on, on this particular notice. Um, so let's start with the first one. And, and I'm gonna ask these questions. So I'm gonna be the host here now. And Austin's gonna be the person that's gonna be on the hot seat answering these. So we're gonna do it a uh, law school, law school uh, fashion here. Okay, so does the penalty relief apply to the streamlined filing Title 26 miscellaneous 5% penalty? So for those that don't know what that is, basically to get access to an amnesty program for those folks that are residing inside the United States, 
you actually have to pay a 5% penalty. It's based on the highest year end aggregate value between a six year period. And a lot of these streamlined filings that we do, I always tell the client this, my guess is it's always gonna be one of the last years in the series, because that tends to be the highest year. Um, and so a lot of folks actually do have a 5% penalty that's based off of 2019 or 2020. So the question here, does this relief apply to that Title 26 miscellaneous penalty if it happened on 2019 or 2020? All right, you're starting off with the softball questions. And unfortunately for any of you that are listening that have gone through Streamline, this does not apply to that. The Streamline um, was its own kind of deal. There was a publicized penalty. You know, everybody knew what was going on with that. And the, the purpose of this notice is not to unwind kind of deals that you've made with the IRS, procedures you've made with the IRS. It's again, more of a clearing of backlog of computer generated penalties. So the answer to that one is unfortunately no. Okay. Follow-up question, which is very similar to that question. And this normally occurs when people are doing, now the Office of Voluntary Disclosure Program closed a couple of years back, thank goodness. I went to close, I, I told everyone I know I'm never doing one of those ever again. Because <laughs> they're just so, they're so awful. No one ever comes out like, you know, liking anybody after that. Um, but we have an offshore voluntary disclosure, which now exists inside the Internal Revenue Manual. Let's say you go through that, or maybe even an older offshore voluntary disclosure. There's a very special Title 26 miscellaneous penalty that takes a wide variety of forms. Could be, was it 27 and a half, 25 percent? I forget all the different percentages. but. You basically did that. You signed a closing agreement, the 7121 with the IRS. And that also can apply to a lot of other, IRS has other amnesty programs where you sign closing agreements. Um, but let's say that that penalty was, was applicable to 2019 or 2020. Um, what do you think? Does this does this resolve that penalty for them? I'm not gonna like my answer to, uh, say, same as above. This is not intended to uh, have any impact on people going through any sort of formal disclosure process, um, such as the streamline or the IRM voluntary disclosure. So unfortunately, you know, it's again, that was the deal that you cut. The IRS is not intending to change that deal. Um, this is, is, it's meant to clear the backlog of, of other kind of computer generated penalties, not things that you voluntarily went to the IRS through this formal disclosure program. Great. Okay. Now hybrid question, which is not on here, but I think I know the answer to this. If I'm doing a streamlined filing and I submit that before September 30th, does this relief supersede the penalty that may apply to 19 and 20 within the streamlined filing? Our understanding is it's not. Now, the follow-up to that is, which um, we I'm not sure uh, we've talked about it yet, but like any, this is, we talked about, there was a slide of, there's three buckets of taxpayers this is going to affect, right? right? Bucket number one is people that have amnesties pending. What you're describing is bucket number two, which is, people that are about to submit, they've been working on it, but they haven't hit send. And for those people, uh, th this, this is only gonna, you know, the 30 day window, right? But for those people, I would strongly consider discussing with your tax professional. We're also happy to advise on this, but does the streamline still, is it still the best answer with, because this notice doesn't affect your streamline. Your 5% penalty is not gonna be affected. It doesn't, it doesn't impact it at all, but, this notice could impact doing a quiet disclosure, not through the streamlined. What you'd have to do is evaluate what forms are implicated. As we talked about earlier, this notice 2022-36 um, does not give you amnesty for all international forms. So as an example, if your streamlined filing was just going to be a 5471 problem, let's say starting in 2019, you opened up a foreign company that year. Maybe before streamline was the right answer, but this could be an opportunity if that's literally the only form and the only years that are delinquent are 19 and 20, maybe you consider a different disclosure path. But other, uh, but if there's other forms like 8938s and FBARs, you may not. So that's a long, long answer to the question of it's not going to impact the streamline procedures, whether or not you already submitted or you're about to submit. Right, and we'll have some follow-up questions related to, to that fact pattern that you just stated, but I think Austin summarizes it very well. The, this notice is going to work, you know, in, in conjunction with the facts and circumstances. They're going to really drive whether you continue forward with that, that client number two, streamline filing, or whether you kind of dovetail back and say, hey, we're going to do notice 2022-36. Okay, we'll come back to that. So everyone put a pin in that. Let's, we're going to continue going forward. 
Okay, does the penalty relief apply to years outside of 2019 or 2020? So would it apply to 18, would it apply to 21? It doesn't. Uh, I, eventually I'd like to stop saying no, Michigan, because this is actually a really great notice that's come out, but we need to understand the limitations. And I've got tons of clients with 15, 16, 17, 18 penalties. Um, and, and when you talk about the penalties too, the 18 penalty may have been assessed in 19 or 20, but what matters is what tax year does it relate to? And again, this is a, while it's fantastic and there's a billion dollars coming to taxpayers, um, hopefully in the next couple months, um, it's, it is limited and it does not, just because if you're one year off, you don't get it. So 2018, 35, 20 does not get automatic relief. Great. Okay. This question is for my, the G4 visa holders that are normally typical Wolf, Wolf Group clients, um, but also non-residents in general. So if I'm a non-resident and maybe I've not reported, you know, um, my U.S. source rental income uh, or, or, you know, non-effectively connected, uh, you know, capital gains and U.S. source dividends on my 1040NR, and I've kind of, I think this applies to client number three, right? They, they know they have an issue, but maybe they haven't done anything yet. Um, do you do the, the relief apply to form 1040 and R? The failure let, me th let me throw this one back at you because you have, uh, you've looked at this a little more recently. <laughs> Is this one also a no? Yes, this one, this one no, this one's a yes. Actually, I, I, I tricked everybody here. Uh, nice. I, I added in a yes here. So it's the entire 1040 series gets that relief. And I put this in here because I regularly come across G4s that have had U.S. source rental income. And normally the, the tip off is they go to sell their home and they have FERPTA, uh, the FERPTA withholding. And a lot of times you're not going to get the stamp signed copy of the FERPTA withholding back from the IRS until they know that you're fully compliant. So there's a lot of folks out there that need to do this, this rental income reporting. Maybe they've got several years they have to do it for um, potentially, you know, we may want to say, hey, look, we're going to take 19 and 20, we're going to pull it out of that project, and we're going to submit that immediately um, before September 30th. But the rest of those years, we can kind of, you know, play with it and do that, you know, in, in a different time period. So, but you got to be careful with that, because there's some elections that have to be done in the first year of filing that you had to think through. Um, it's basically on a facts and circumstances type basis that you would do the, the late 1040 NR. Okay, last one, and I think I know your answer to this one, Austin. Uh, lesson for this slide, does the penalty relief apply to other penalties beyond the failure to file penalty? And so, for example, we see that there could be a fraudulent failure to file penalty. Um, would it apply to that? I, I think the answer to that one's no as well. Again, this is more of the computer generated um, penalties. The fraudulent failure to file is not a computer generated penalty. Um, and then going back to your 1040 in our question, it's the same sort of relief. It would just be the failure to file if there's failure to pay and interest, et cetera, that's still gonna be assessed. So while welcome, it's not a, a get out of jail free card for these late 1040 filings. Absolutely, okay. Big question here that I think a lot of people wanna know, and I think we've alluded to this, we've talked about it, but, and, and this, may be, this may be dovetails into the next two questions, but is the penalty relief meant to be used as an alternative to streamline filing? And I, I think to help you kind of, you know, center your discussion a little bit, we'll go ahead and do the next question as well. Does the penalty relief insulate a taxpayer from auditor examination for prior year non-compliance? So again, now going outside of your, your fact pattern, you said, hey, we started a business in 2019, uh, a foreign business. Let's assume now you have a business maybe started in 2015 and it's a controlled foreign corporation and you've got multiple years of CFC filings that have not been done. What do, what do we think about that? Yeah, this is a great question. It's been very interesting as a practitioner because we're having to, you know, create our our guidance on the spot as the world keeps changing, right? The penalty landscape changes. You know, my view of this is that the streamline filing compliance procedures is still going to be the best way to deal with non-compliance for clients and taxpayers who are non-wealthy. And this is is only in very limited circumstances going to be a better option for someone who is now in this one month period, right, has the opportunity to decide which path to go down. And the reason for that being is, is as we talked about, this is only limited to two years in certain forms. So, you know, a couple of different examples. Um, one example is, let's say the, the only issues you have relate to, as you said, Michigan, 5471s. But the 5471 issue goes all the way back to, let's say, 2011. 
So there's transition tax issues. There's, you know, multiple years open under the statute. Um, there, there's, you know, all kinds of other related issues there. Yes, your 2019 and 2020, while most likely to be penalized based on how the IRS does things, they can go back other years when this form is unfiled. And so if you don't, the streamlined procedures deal they give you is you do three years of income tax returns with delinquent um, uh, international information returns, six years of FBARs, and they don't make you go back further. And they, they you know, a, as much as they can without doing an audit, kind of say they're not going to penalize you for that. So it is meant to, the streamlined procedures is meant to give you, um, you know, non-penalty treatment for those prior years. This notice does not. This notice is just for those two years and just for those forms. And like I said, even most likely in, in most circumstances, taxpayers don't just have one covered form, like a 5471 that's implicated. Usually there's also an 8938 or an FBAR or 926, like, like and, and some of those are not getting um, automatic penalty relief through this program. So you gotta be, I think there are, which is question number three, we're about to get to, right. I think there may be some limited circumstances that there is an opportunity here. But I think in most cases, the streamlined procedures is still your absolute best bet for handling these non-compliance issues in a you know taxpayer-friendly and streamlined way. Great. Okay. And this maybe actually plays into the fourth question as well, but I put this question here primarily because I want to make sure from my point of view as the preparer for a lot of people that, then the question is, are there any danger zones to be aware of for the submission of these forms before the deadline? <clears throat> and one of the biggest concerns I have is people are starting to say, look, we've got, we have to rush. We got to rush. We got to get it in. We got to get it done. These forms are not forms that you rush. They take a very long time. I don't know if anyone's ever looked at the bottom of the instructions of the forms, but it tells you how long the IRS thinks it should take. Um, and the IRS is always, you know, it, it, that actually is pretty pretty good number that they put on there. But the number of hours it takes to do some of these forms are, you know, beyond belief. The Form 5471, which has schedules A through like R, is its own little booklet. It's like a mini corporate return within an individual return. The form 3520 and 3520As, there's so many crossovers and tie-ins between those two forms and then the individual tax return. You know, if, if you move too fast on those, you could per, perhaps submit an inaccurate or incomplete form. And sure, you may get, you know, a failure, you may get abatement of the failure to file penalty, but now you've opened yourself up for audit and examination and incomplete or inaccurate form penalty. I mean, there's all there's a whole host of other things. So Sure, you won the battle, but you're, now you're going to lose the war because you basically alerted the IRS to all these other issues that you have floating around there, and you've submitted a very poor quality product. Um, and as I always tell people, you know, there's there's three things, right? You can do quality, you can do speed, or you can do cheap, but you can't have all three. You got to choose one. And in this situation, what I would tell folks is, if you've got a good quality product and it meets a certain set of uh, uh, facts and circumstances where it's going to work really well without creating a host of other issues, I think I think then you would utilize these procedures. But outside of that, you gotta be really, really careful. Um, some of these forms, for example, and this is the last comment I'll make, the 5471, you know, it's they've come out and clearly stated that, that if you fail to file that form for prior years, it keeps the statute for assessment open for the entire return, not just the 5471. So right now, for example, I think we're doing an audit case where the IRS has gone back and audited the client all the way back to 2013 for their 5471 compliance because they never filed that form for all of those years. I mean, that's a huge, that's a massive, a massive audit there with a massive amount of work because that client failed to file that one form. It's kept the entire return open. So this is the danger zone I think of when I when I see this notice come out in a small amount of time. And Austin, maybe you can also speak to why they're only giving a small amount of time here, but. This is, uh, this is uh, something that I think everyone should be aware of. Austin? Yeah, no, I have a couple of comments. So one, why is it only till September 30th? Now, again, this is a practitioner's viewpoint. This is not, you know, the IRS. And, and the IRS, I'm sure, has a lot of rationale, but they're not always going to tell you because, you know, they're it's a cat and mouse game, right? And they're, they're the cat. So uh, we're, we're here to help you avoid them to the extent possible. Um, I believe they gave till September 30th because they didn't want to you know, we've, we've always got a pipeline of clients that we're just about to hit send on. And I think they didn't want to disadvantage somebody who had done all the work. It takes months sometimes to get all the information. 
as Michigan said, if you have high quality tax preparation, it's going to take a little time because these forms are really complicated. And they wanted to give people a few weeks to, to finish up and get things in without disadvantaging them. What they didn't want to do is leave open for those who had not already started the process. They didn't want to give them six months to say, oh, well, now that this is a, such a good deal or you know, the facts have changed in my favor, now I'm going to go ahead and, and submit. So that's why I think the timeline is short. To uh, echo what Michigan said, if you, I think this is the big risk. So the streamlined procedures is around now. It's gonna be around after September 30th. I don't know if it'll be around forever, but we've Michigan and I, when it came out on July 1st, 2014, never thought we'd be sitting here in 2022 and it'd still be around. The IRS, uh, when we talk to them, they say, well, it'll be around as long as there's a business purpose. And from my perspective, there's still a business purpose for it. And so it's still gonna be there after September 30th. If you submit something quickly and it's wrong, you're then gonna be three months down the line or you know, when your tax preparer looks at your stuff next year in the same position, needing to make a disclosure because your 5471s were wrong or you missed some, and you may just end up doing a streamline anyway. And so you spent a bunch of money, you rushed, you, you, submit, you uh, had some, some risk that you've um, subjected yourself to because you've submitted incomplete information to the IRS, and then you're still gonna end up having to do a second cleanup anyway. So I think there are definitely circumstances that you know we're sitting here on September 1st, maybe you can rush and get something done, uh, easier facts, maybe get simple 5471. But if you've got a really complicated scenario, I'd be wary to say, I'm going to drop everything to make this work, because in many cases, you may just be doing a second cleanup next year. That's right. And, and unfortunately, I think we have a lot of folks that are in the industry that may, may, may promise pie in the sky. Oh, yes, I'll get that one done. We'll do it accurately. And then, you know, when, when we get it, for example, we look at it, it's like, this is completely wrong. <laughs> you know, that, the, the entries don't make a lot of sense. Nothing ties in. So um, I, I think Austin is exactly right. There could, you could, again, you may win the war on one little issue, but you could open yourself up to losing the entire battle. Um, okay, moving on, because uh, we're going to run out of time here. Um, the notice provides failure to file penalty relief for both international and domestic forms. You know, this is something that I think is also super interesting. Are there combinations of these filings where you get both relief for the, the 1040 and the 5471 or the, the 5472 where it makes sense, you know, like, hey, we're looking at it both ways here, looking at combinations of these filings. You know, are there any examples that, that come to your mind where it like works out really well? Yeah, I'm curious to get your thoughts too as the drafter of this question. But I, I, I mean, I think there's definitely circumstances where you know, if, if somebody has late filed a 1040 and has a couple of information returns that like the 5471 that would have been included, you know, they may end up in a, a really good situation. They're able to, they have submitted recently, or if they can submit before September 30th, where they're going to have many different avenues where they're getting automatic relief. This is all, of course, assuming you can get this done by September 30th, which is not a very big runway. And, you know, for those of you who are not practitioners in the audience, um, as you probably know, this is starting to be the time of year where your CPA doesn't return your phone calls. And it's not because they don't love you, but it's because it's busy season, which compounds on trying to get stuff done right now, especially new stuff. So that makes it even harder. What, what yeah. are your thoughts, Michigan? Have you thought of any creative combos? Yeah, I mean, look, in, in, in my head, I'm thinking of, of people that maybe have the 3520 part four and they have yeah. to file between 1040 or a distribution from a foreign non-grantor trust. Um, and they haven't filed the 1040. So there, I think that, you know, you can say, look, we, we're not only curing this 35% penalty, we're also going to help you with the 1040 failure to file penalty. So it's kind of like a double, you know, a double relief or double help there. Now, as we indicated earlier, there's still the failure to pay and the interest and all the other stuff in there. But, you know, th that those are the calculations that I think your client's going to want to see, like, okay, what happens if I did nothing or I had to go through streamlined filing versus what happens if we take advantage of this you know, relief, and I, I can meet this without creating any other danger zones. You know, I think that's the kind of weighing that has to be done there. Um, playing into the next question, I think also you have to think about, okay, the relief that is for failure to file at the federal level, but it's not at the state level. So your state return may still get a failure to file penalty. What about states that enforce penalties for IRS international forms? So what about the state of California, for example? where they're going to hit you with a $10,000 penalty for failing to find the 
failure to file the 5471, uh, you know, make sure that I think we, my comment here would be, hey, let's make sure we think through that before we do that filing. What do you think about that, Austin? I, I agree, um, because th this notice does not apply to the states. States can, can do what they want on this, and not a lot of states do, but California is an example of one that has a, a, a piggyback penalty that it can assess. So it, uh, it just kind of further complicates the situation. Um, okay. So we got one more question in Michigan. There's a really good question in the chat that I think we might want to get to before we uh, we head off here. Um, do you want to? Yeah. I can hit this last question real quick, and then maybe let's let's discuss the one in the chat. Sure, let's do that. Okay. So last question, then we'll go to the chat. Um, what do we think about the future here, Austin? Does this signal you know more lenient relief from the IRS on international forms, or you know do we think that the additional funding where the IRS is saying or Congress is saying for every dollar we give you, you got to give us back $7 or $8 or whatever the ROI is these days. Um, what do we think this forebodes for the future in your, in your crystal ball? I think that this is clearing a backlog because in it's clearing a backlog of penalties that they think that they probably had some <laughs> play into and it's clearing, you know, because of all the information return destruction, I think it's clearing a backlog of <laughs> pandemic related things. I don't think it is showing leniency towards international information returns okay i think that it is just a procedurally look let's clear what happened some mistakes were your fault some mistakes were my fault some mistakes were the coronavirus fault uh but going forward where i think the real risk is we talked about computer generated penalties i don't think those are going away but i think audit enforcement is the future the irs is hiring seventy-eight thousand people and international assets foreign assets have consistently been a area of tax non-compliance uh, in an area where the IRS believes there is you know a lot of fruitful amounts of, of tax and penalties to assess. So I think this is kind of a one-time special situation that I understand why they did it, but don't think that means they're not going to start coming after people on this stuff. Okay, great answer. I agree with that wholeheartedly. Let's go to the individual question. So the question is, if an individual initial abatement request was declined, and they're in the process of submitting an appeal, should they still follow through with the appeal request? The due date is right around the corner for the appeal request. It's, it's September 16th. The individual does qualify for abatement of late filing of Form 3520. What do you think, Austin? You know, it's a great question. Um, if the work's kind of already been done for this appeal, so in my practice, I, I often draft the reasonable cause, which is the case, right? before, when, when sometimes even before the, uh, the penalties are even assessed. And so the appeal for me is usually just saying, hey guys, no one's read this, please read this. And so it's not a lot of, of work, it's not a lot of professional fees to do it. So, you know, the safer answer is, if it's not gonna be a massive amount of work, maybe you just go ahead and submit it. And because you wanna make sure, you know, something doesn't go wrong. If you don't respond to the appeal, it doesn't mean that there's no way into appeals but it just takes a lot longer because you're gonna to have to go through the 843 process and get a, an advocate assigned. So, you know, I can tell you this, the notice says if you're covered and I don't know your facts, but it sounds like you think you're covered that you shouldn't have to do anything. But I also know as being a practitioner and haven't done this a long time that just cause the IRS says they're gonna do something doesn't mean they will. And you have the option right now to, you know preserve your appeals rights and a route to an agent. So I would maybe weigh it based on if it's not a lot of work, maybe just go ahead and submit it as a, you know, again, kind of protective measure. And ideally, this is all supposed to be resolved in the next couple of months. And so you won't have to do anything else. Um, I, that's probably what I would do just to, to, to be safe, assuming it's not a ton of extra work. Yeah, I agree with that. Better safe than sorry. In my opinion, get, get it documented, get it in there, just in case something doesn't fit the facts or gets kicked out in some way, shape or form. Um, I definitely think that that should be done. Okay, so with that, we're, we're out of time. We're way out of time. <laughs> we, we've run over a little bit longer than we need to. But um, okay, wait, we have, another, we have another question here. Austin, are you good for one more? Absolutely. Okay, a question on foreign gifts. Is, is it 5% up to 25% penalty for not informing or is, is it the tax rate or how is the percentage determined? So basically, the question is, how do you determine the penalty on the Form 3520 Part 4 if it's late? Yeah, and this is one of those, the 3520 part four is a, a really nasty beast. Um, gifts or inheritances from foreign persons are not taxable in the US. 
However, they're required to be reported on this 3520 part four. The, tax, the, the penalty due is not based on any amount of tax because there's zero tax due, but it's based on the amount of gift or inheritance. And unfortunately, it starts at 5%. If you're late for five months, it can go all the way up to 25%. So even if you wouldn't owe any tax on it, if, if you're over that 100,000 or so threshold, it's gonna be 25% of that, notwithstanding any sort of income tax implications. Yeah, and I've seen that happen a lot to people living offshore because they don't get the notice from the IRS that, hey, you still have not responded. Here's an additional 5%. Here's an additional 5%. And then finally, the client comes to me and they're like, hey, I got a 25% penalty on, <laughs> on this inheritance of a million dollars. You know, it's, you know, it's a lot of money. What do I do? Um, that, that definitely can happen and has happened before. Okay, if we don't have any other questions, and just uh, wait for one second to see if there's any more, but if we don't, um, thank you everybody for, for joining the, the webinar today. Hopefully you got some actionable intelligence for how to deal with this notice. We, we, Austin and I regularly check into this stuff and we keep people informed. And um, if, if you need to get a hold of us, let us know. We're happy to talk to you and, and see if we can help you out. Um, but as I said at the very beginning of this presentation, it's really based on your facts and circumstances. Make sure you get those analyzed and talk to someone like Austin so he can give you the right advice. All right, guys, we'll see you later. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody.